everybody. Reporting to you again from the glamour city, Hollywood. The supply of carbon allowance permits, and this is the correct term, in these regulated markets, it's called an allowance permit because each permit allows the polluter to emit one ton of carbon dioxide. And in the regulated market, that supply is capped. And each year, the supply declines lower and lower, thereby inducing abatement and a reduction in emissions among the constituents. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Michael Aslan, founder and CEO of Carbon Cap Management. Welcome to the show today. Thank you, Scott. Great to be here. Your focus since 2018 has been on carbon pricing, carbon trading, emissions trading systems, and the fundamental carbon market research. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more. Sure. So I'm Scott. I'm originally a Canadian, but I've been in London, England now for 30 years. I did my graduate degree at London Business School. London Business School is kind of the Harvard of Europe, I suppose, in terms of business schools. I've been teaching on the graduate degree program at LBS now for 19 years. And uh, the last four to five years, I've been teaching a segment on the impact of climate change on the asset management industry. My professional background is uh, working initially as a proprietary trader with two of Canada's banks. I then worked after my graduate degree in the asset management industry in a number of roles before founding my first asset management business in 2005. I was very fortunate that business grew to a modestly successful and profitable business, um, and I achieved an exit event selling the company to a Swiss public company um, in 2013. I had a two and a half year earnout, and at the end of that period, this is when I became focused on climate change. And I began uh, my research, as I always do when I'm interested in something, I begin with peer-reviewed academic research. I, I believe that the peer review process is quite a good crucible uh, out of which normally comes the truth. And after reviewing more than 200 scientific papers on climate change, and it did take me a while to learn the terminology, but I, I became convinced the problem was acute. And, and this was uh, about a year before Greta Thunberg burst onto the scene and climate really became um, uh, you know, more popular as, as, it, as it was. Um, this prompted me to... Uh, to enroll at the London School of Economics, another esteemed institution here in London, England, in their economics and governance program of climate change. And in that program, I learned many things, but this is where I was first exposed to carbon markets as a policy mechanism to address emissions. And uh, co after completing that program at that time, this was now 2018, carbon markets were trading about 10 billion US dollars every month. And so that's a certain, that's a decent amount of liquidity. And my first question as an investment professional was this asset class, carbon, it's a liquid asset class. I was curious about the statistical properties of the asset class, like what have been the historical returns, how volatile is the asset class, and in particular, what is the correlation of this asset class versus other asset classes? And when I looked at for literature, Scott, there, there was none. So I hired a PhD student from the LSE and together we collected the data and we wrote the, the, the first seminal paper on carbon as an asset class. Now that did take three years in the peer review process, but the paper was finally published in the summer of 2022, and it remains to this day as the seminal paper on, on examining carbon as an investable liquid asset class, as well as its primary function, of course, which is to, um, to achieve the capping and, and reduction of emissions. Um, I presented that research at a conference. 
in Spain, and I was approached by the CEO of a Swiss private bank. He said, are you looking for backing? And in a nutshell, they did their DD. They took a 10% stake, Scott, in the business. My old partner rejoined me, and uh, I launched my second business, which um, culminated with the launching of uh, the world's first multi-market carbon fund. And now the fund has a four-year track record. It's grown significantly. Last year, we grew from 125 million to 330 million in assets under management. Uh, we have 85 investors, and seven of those are uh, large institutional clients. And over this period, uh, the fund is up approximately uh, 110%. So very strong performance. Um, as well as a direct climate impact, and be happy to tell you more about the impact side of the fund uh, in a few moments. So that that's um, that's a quick executive summary on my background and and where we've uh, come to with our company Carbon Cap thus far. So, Michael, in regards to the the seminal paper you're referring to, this is the one that was published on Journal of Alternative Investments, right? And that is correct. And why don't we uh, start with uh, what is Carbon Cap Management? But before that, just a second is, you know, I, you know, as somebody who himself uh, finds value in referee journal, peer review journal, and constantly reading nature publication, for instance, in the field that I, I specialize in, I love the fact that you took a, took a very systematic, broad macro approach, and then focus on something that's very cute and very specific niche. But at the same time, I think there was liquidity back then, but the market was fairly still fragmented. I guess that's probably the best way to say it. And it was somewhat of a wild, wild west. And I think we're just starting to get into more of a regulated, liquid, true kind of a marketplace, so to speak. But I wonder if you could give us a little bit of background over the years that you've seen the carbon market and then get into what the carbon cap management does. Sure. So, so the first thing that's really important, Scott, here is to clarify, because there's a lot of confusion about the different carbon markets that exist. And there are, in fact, three very different carbon markets. And, and, and so I think this is very important to go through. The market, perhaps, that you, you had commented, commented on a moment ago was the voluntary carbon market. And the voluntary market, as the name suggests, it is voluntary. There's no, there's no forced or mandatory participation. And a good example, and, and indeed, this is the market that most people are familiar with. They may have seen something when they book a flight, they could offset their emissions by clicking, and a small amount of money will go to a project where they, they, they say they will plant some trees, and as the trees grow, those trees will indeed sequester carbon. Um, and, and the correct term in that market is the carbon offset or a carbon credit. This is where these terms offset and credit are used. I always mention five key bullet points when people are trying to understand the difference between the voluntary market and the market we invest in, which is the regulated market. And here are the five. The voluntary market, first of all, is unregulated. This is a financially traded asset with no financial oversight or regulation. Number two, it's very small in size. Number three, it is illiquid. It's a private equity asset. Number four, the methodology for the calculation is complex and opaque. Many different types of methodologies. Um, there's no standardization. And number five, unlimited supply of these carbon credits and offsets. And I truly mean that in the sense that um, the number of new projects with tens of millions of credits associated with them are continually announced. And of course, without having any independent financial oversight or regulatory oversight within a financial asset, as you would expect, moral hazard looms large. And in the last two years, there's been a, a quite a large number of scandals and, and bad instances in that market. So that's market one. We're not involved. I'm, carbon cap is not involved in that market whatsoever. My hope is at some point it will become regulated, uh, but currently it, it is not. If we move the lens to the second market where we are involved, these are the regulated carbon markets. The same five points. Number one, highly regulated. Number two, very large. Maybe just to highlight the size. 
Last year, the regulated carbon markets traded a total value of approximately one trillion US dollars. The voluntary market did perhaps one to two billion. So this is about a 1,000 fold differential. This is not 10 times bigger. This is orders of magnitude difference between these two. So highly regulated, large, very liquid. I mentioned our research, 10 billion a month was the traded value five years ago. Today, that is 70 billion per month. So there's been a significant increase in liquidity and indeed in the number of markets in the world. Number four, transparent. The government, of course, publishes all the rules. And number five, and most important, the supply of carbon allowance permits. And this is the correct term. In these regulated markets, it's called an allowance permit because each permit allows the polluter to emit one ton of carbon dioxide. And in the regulated market, that supply is capped. And each year, the supply declines lower and lower, thereby inducing abatement and a reduction in emissions among the constituents. So there's, there's, to put it mildly, there's a lot of blue water between the voluntary market and the regulated compliance carbon markets. Um, and be, I would be happy to um, explain, you know, how these regulated markets function. But perhaps the, you know, the proof is in the pudding. The European Union uh, cap and trade market, which was launched after seeing the success in the United States of the sulfur dioxide cap and trade program under the Bush administration. The Europeans launched the European carbon market in 2005 and the emissions in 04 prior to launch were 4.2 gigatons in that year. In 2022, emissions were 3.2 gigatons. So there has been a 1 billion ton per year decline in emissions in Europe. And most importantly, 770 million of the billion. So almost all of it has been directly uh, from the entities covered under the emission trading system. So this is a very, very successful policy mechanism to cap and lower emissions at the lowest cost of society. And now we're seeing it spread around the world. And it's one of the things that gives me a bit of hope, given where we are in, on the issue of climate change, which in my, in my view, we're, we're doing quite poorly. Well, first of all, I want to say that it's ex exactly what I wanted to hear. And it's very promising to see that the regulated market has grown by a significant factor, uh, several fold. And as we look to the future where the supply of these allowance permits are going to decrease, that also means that the premium on these uh, these cap uh, cap and trade uh, the, uh, pro products are going to be quite profitable, right? So can you talk about how you apply the two strategies, my understanding is core strategy and alpha strategies to capitalize on some of these things recognizing that as we continue to see decrease in supply or the cap of it, that it's going to become much more profitable, not to mention there's that uh, low correlation to other other asset classes. Yeah, sure. So the, the first thing um, in terms of the functioning of a carbon market, uh, it took me about two weeks to fully understand the mechanism but once you do, I would say, you know, from an economics perspective, we call something that 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 works extremely well a, a parsimonious solution. In other words, it it really covers all the bases, and and a carbon market really ticks those boxes. So the way it works is that it begins by saying any company above a threshold is included in the market. You do not have a choice; it's mandatory, and usually that's twenty five thousand tons per year. So if you emit more than twenty five thousand, you're in. Um, they, they then, the government then audits you every year on your emissions, and you must give permits to the government for every ton that is emitted. Now, the source of the permits comes from the government. So in California, where there's a, there's a long established carbon market in the state of California, the government will auction the permits four times per year. And that's how the supply of permits comes into the market. The underlying companies, of course, will are big emitters. So these are steel, cement, chemicals and and the power sector who burn coal and gas to make electricity they will estimate their emissions of course and they will buy the permits knowing they must comply 
At the end of one single compliance year, and there's an annual cycle, all the companies are audited very carefully by the government. And if your company emitted a million tons of emissions, you must give the government 1 million permits. The penalties are very severe. And therefore, in these markets, we tend to get 99.9% compliance. So to go through one cycle in California, they sell 300 million permits. They audit the constituent companies. And let's say the total emissions are 300 million. Those companies will give those permits back to the government and the government will destroy them. In year two, the government auctions 290 million and then destroys those. Then 280, 270, 260. So every year, the supply of these permits declines, which forces someone within the ecosystem to reduce. Someone must cut their emissions. And this is where the power of the mechanism kicks in because each CEO looks at two carbon prices, the permit price, which in California today is $42 per ton. And then the CEO looks at their internal abatement costs. What's what's our cost to cut emissions? Now, if my internal cost is $100 and the permit is 40, that's an easy decision. I simply buy the permit and I comply with the government rules. However, if my cost is $20 to cut my emissions, then I make more profit by investing CapEx into my business, reducing my carbon footprint, and I, do, I, I forego buying permits at $40, I cut my emissions at a cost of 20. And this is why the objective and indeed the, the outcome of a carbon market are the three magic words, least cost abatement. This is the objective. We don't want to reduce emissions at any cost. We must reduce emissions at the lowest possible cost to society. And that is what the price signal does. As long as we have liquidity in this market, and these markets trade quite heavily, we can be pretty confident that every CEO in California, they know the external price and they know their internal price. And therefore, when we reduce the number of permits, we can be quite confident that indeed the companies with the lowest cost of abatement, the lowest internal cost, they choose to abate. They self-select themselves to cut their emissions. And therefore we climb this marginal abatement cost curve every year. As you point out, we should over time see higher and higher prices. So the mechanism is, is very smart. The revenues the government gets from selling these permits 100% of the revenue is segregated and reinvested in energy efficiency and low carbon initiatives. So as I said, it's a parsimonious, it it ticks all the boxes. It's a very smart mechanism. And now China has launched, South Korea has launched, Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam um, is launching, Mexico. So, So again, it's proliferating and we see the asset class growing from, went from 10 billion a month now it trades 70 billion to two to 300 billion. And between five and 10 years from now, Scott, we foresee that carbon will overtake crude oil as the most liquid commodity on the planet and then stay there for quite a few decades. So again, from a mechanism and from a policy, I think it's ingenious, it really is. But I wonder if you could talk about some of the evidence that shows that these, let's call it, cost-benefit analysis, CEOs and these corporations are making the decisions to internalize and put in the right type of CapEx to be able to actually reduce their carbon output, for instance. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the beauty here, Scott, in terms of you know trying to figure out if the mechanism achieves the least cost abatement, we, we know there's abatement every year because there's simply less permits. We're playing musical chairs and we pull out a chair. So you have the same number of participants, but you you have less permits. So you can't have emissions greater than the permits, right? And and so we achieve objective one of lowering emissions, but, but you're right. That second question, how can we be certain that we're getting least cost abatement? The beauty here is because, you know, when we're talking about companies that are profit motivated, they simply make more profit. The companies who self-select themselves where their internal cost is below the permit price, the reason they they will choose to do that, the evidence, the reason, they make more profit. And I think we can be quite confident that when when a corporate has a decision made, return on capital decision to make, it does skew towards the profit. And, 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 you know, I've been very surprised. Um, Indeed, our fund because we have a direct impact on climate change, the fund holds 
Article 9 status under the European taxonomy, which is the highest level of impact. But I have been quite disappointed at the interest in the impact side of what we do amongst our investor base. Most, I mean, they should be mainly driven by return and risk, which, which is completely, I think, should be paramount. But there really had, we've have, we have really one institution out of 85 investors that was very focused on the, on the climate side. So I'll just, uh, just elucidate on that for a moment. Our objectives in the fund are, are, we have two objectives. Over 12 month rolling windows, we always want to have a positive rate of return. So we run an absolute return fund. But our second objective is to have a direct impact on climate change. Now, we looked at how could we align ourselves with our clients in this regard. And my partner came up with the idea. We looked at the voluntary market. Of course, when we did a deep dive there, we could not become comfortable for all the reasons I, I mentioned. So we decided that we would take, Scott, 20% of our performance fee that is calculated based on how, how the fund performs. That's a gross revenue stream for the business, not net. It's part of our gross. And we would commit that to use those funds to purchase carbon permits in the regulated market, much higher price. And we would cancel those permits to prevent those permits ever being used to emit a ton of carbon. And therefore, what we've done is we've created a nice alignment between us as the manager, performance, we have to perform, and climate impact. And so more performance in the fund means more climate impact. And we've now, um, as I mentioned, we've crystallized performance fees for four years running, and we've, we've canceled substantial amounts of carbon every year. And as the fund has grown, that is getting larger and larger and more impactful, which I'm very, very pleased about. So here's a here's a follow up question, which is if in fact that strategy works for some of the largest institutional investors that truly care about climate impact, would it make sense for them instead of doing all the different types of myriads of action oriented climate action oriented types of initiatives, but simply reduce the supply by outright purchasing those permits on an annual basis and eliminating it so that it just doesn't become available, kind of like what we're seeing with uh, with uh, crypto in the sense of some are going into cold chain where it's just kind of locked away, for instance. In this case, it just isn't become doesn't become available to the marketplace. Yes. So when we announced that we would be doing this, it was seen as very unorthodox. And the reason is because the permit prices were you know $50 a ton, $60, $70, $80, $100 a ton, when in the voluntary market, the one I mentioned earlier, that is a lack of regulation, um, you can buy permits for $0.50 cents a ton a dollar a ton, $3 a ton. But I think unfortunately, Scott, you do get what you pay for. And you know, we made a decision that we wanted to do something that was truly impactful and had veracity. And, th and therefore, um, we did that. It was seen as very unorthodox. Very interestingly, one of our institutional clients, um, after asking for our advice on the voluntary carbon market and, and we dissuaded them from, from participating there, they came back to us after some of the scandals and said, Thank you. We avoided, we sort of dodged a bullet there. Could you help us set up so that we could do the same as you? So exactly your idea. So the first institution now has come to us. We were quite surprised and they have now set up, they have, have opened a registry account and they now have the ability to buy and cancel regulated compliance permits in, in, um, you know, in servicing their climate commitment. So I think watch this space. I think it be, could be quite interesting. It is very interesting. My last question, and this is a wrap up for today, is going to be perhaps maybe come somewhat of a contrarian to what we're talking about is that in the last couple of years, the oil and gas companies, publicly traded companies have generated more profit than they ever have done in the last several decades, record profits. And what they have done, instead of reinvesting that into renewable energy or, or initiatives to reduce carbon footprint, they're choosing to buy back shares to further increase uh, their stock share price. So, and, and again, one more data point is that on the, uh, the Permian Basin, we're seeing a, a significant M&A consolidation as that market becomes strong. And even on the EV side, Biden administration starting to kind of taper back in terms of pressuring the EV transition happening on the original timeframe. So 
Just trying to take a step back and see if, in fact, this regulated market is really making a difference or the heavy polluters will continue to pollute profit and pass on their costs to the ultimate intermediaries and the end consumers. Yeah, I mean, um, Scott, I can tell you, I used to be, um, you know, when it comes to an investment stance with regard to fossil fuel companies, um, the two most common stances are to engage or to divest. And I was very much uh, an engagement person, uh, thinking that uh, the, 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 the strategy there runs like as follows, you, you hold some shares, you agitate for change, um, and you hope to see change. And then eventually, if you don't see change, you exit, you sell your shares. I think the, the, the data that you've pointed out, and as I, as I mentioned, I mean, I'm an empiricist. I go by the evidence, and the evidence has been overwhelmingly clear and at odds with what the verbal message of the fossil fuel companies. If we simply look at the CapEx, you are absolutely correct. And I have moved from someone who was willing to be an engagement person to no longer now I'm clearly in the camp of divestment. I do not think that it's going to change. I mean, listen, we can understand you've got trillions of dollars of proven reserves underground, but we know the, car the carbon footprint of digging that up and burning it will simply push us way over the two degree threshold, right? Triggering multiple feedback mechanisms that trigger us into runaway climate change. So they have this huge financial incentive, but of course, if, if you study the data, you understand what the impact of the planet would be. Unfortunately, they don't care. They just wanna get it out of the ground and monetize. So that, mm -hmm. that, I think you're, you're right there. I think when the, 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 uh, I would say, you know, 2015, we had Paris. The next year, 16, was a new record in emissions. 17, 18, 19, all new higher records of emissions on the planet. Only 2020, we had a, a pullback because of COVID. 21 and 22 and 23, all new all-time records in emissions. So we're going in the wrong direction. And we are, if you're familiar with Tim Lenton's work and others on the, on the positive feedback mechanism, many aspects of the planet's natural systems are now shifting from being sequestering carbon to emitting carbon. And, and this is a very dangerous, these tipping points are very dangerous. And uh, personally, I think that whole area of research is still nascent. And the precautionary pr principle says, we, we just simply need to get emissions down. So uh, my hope, um, one of our initiatives this year, Scott, is to sponsor more high quality academic research demonstrating the efficacy of an emission trading system, and then to educate policymakers you know, in emerging market countries and say, look, you're looking for a policy on climate change. You've met a net, made a net zero pledge. You should really look at, or if you're a state governor in the United States, we now have California, Washington state, and 10 states on the East coast of the US individually, all with a carbon market, a regulated cap and trade market. So my hope is that federally, I think in the United States, we can agree, you know, the red and blue divide is too much. We, we won't see federal carbon pricing, but I'm hopeful more individual states like Washington did last year, they launched their own cap and trade carbon market. And now they're in process of linking that with uh, the state of California. So these are the things that give me hope because these cap and trade programs, they cap and lower the emissions. And that is uh, what we need. All right. So with that, I have been joined by Michael Aslan, CEO of Carbon Cap Management. Thank you for joining today. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.